Hope you had a good break out there. Uh, next up, we have reproducible builds in Fedora with Davide and Zvishik. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Davide. I'm Zvishik. And we'll be talking about reproducible builds in Fedora. Uh, so here's the agenda, which I just noticed we forgot to update, uh, but it's still roughly correct. Uh, we'll be talking about reproducible builds in general, uh, then about what we're doing specifically in Fedora. We will have a lot of examples, because people love examples and horror stories. And we will close with where we are, what's going to happen next. Uh, so what are reproducible builds? Uh, reproducible builds, um, the definition of reproducible builds come from the reproducibles.org project. And the idea is that a builder is reproducible if given the same premises, you get the same results, effectively. And like the, the official definition says you have to get from the same source, build environment, build instructions, and get bit by bit identical copies of the artifacts. Um, why would you care about any of these? And, well, there's a few angles you can go for. Uh, some people really care about the security part of this, where if you, if you can recreate the artifacts, you can verify them independently. You can make sure that your supply chain is secure, because um, you can either verify that your supply chain has not been compromised, or you can recreate your supply chain if needed. This is also a way to address the trust in trust problem, where if there's a compromise very high uh, or very under, depending on which side you're starting, I guess, <laughs> uh, the build chain. It might not be entirely visible, uh, but if you can reproduce bit by bit the artifacts, you can tell that something happened that was bad. I think security is great. I personally am more interested in the quality aspect of this, um, because one nice side effect of reproducible builds is that they, they expose a whole class of madness in our environment and lives um, that then we can fix. Um, we can find more broken things and fix them, and that's fun. Uh, so reproducible builds makes it very evident when there are hardware failures in play, if you have a builder that has like bit flips because of bad memory or because like it's not using ECC RAM or something, uh, and your builds are slightly different on one builder but not on the others, uh, you will probably not find out unless your builds start randomly sack faulting, and this is really useful to find it early. It's also a good way to find uh, build system issues. It's not uncommon to have, for example, issues with parallelism around builds where if the order of the build threads is slightly different, your build would produce slightly different outputs. And that's something that will not be entirely obvious unless you happen to hit it when you're debugging in a local build. Also, there are packaging bugs where you could have issues in the packaging build steps, and we will talk about this later. And there can be, can be bugs in the software itself where the software can have dependencies that don't manifest until later from the build environment that will then crop up and make the software produce incorrect results. Um, so these are some examples of why people care about this topic and why we care about this topic. Uh, reproducible builds, as I mentioned, is a thing that started within the Debian project and the Debian community in around 2013. Um, they started attacking the problem, and by 2017, they had large part of the distribution already reproducible. With today, if you go on the dashboard, you can see the, the day of number, but it still hovers around 97, 98%. So I would say the vast majority of Debian is reproducible. And over the years, other distributions and projects have kind of folded into this wider effort. Um, if you, if you happen to use Afteroid to install apps on your phone, for example, Afteroid is another project that is part of reproducible builds that makes an effort to have reproducible builds for their Android APKs. Um, the idea behind reproducible builds is to do automated rebuilds constantly and check that the results continue being the same. It, it is a, it's a fairly simple concept at the end of the day. Uh, they are very pretty dashboards, um, which we do not use that, but we would like to use eventually. They also build tools that have been really helpful as part of these projects. And two tools they built are Diffoscope and Strip Non-Determinism. Um, Diffoscope, in particular, is really handy because it makes you be able to tell what is different about the builds in an interesting ways. Um, please. So the, the Diffoscope uh, is a tool that takes a file, an artifact, uh, and um, unpacks it if it's composed of stuff, and then does this recursively, and then does a diff uh, at the very, I mean, as, as so, so let's say you have a, a tar archive that is compressed, and inside it has uh, static archives, which are archives with object files, and inside of the object files you have symbols and so on, and then it will go all the way down and do a diff. Yeah, and stream non-determinism is a tool that um, removes things like timestamps from binaries, um, we'll talk about this in a moment. Stream non-determinism is written in Perl, which makes it impractical for using Fedora because we do not want to have Perl in the build route for every package. Um, so we will talk about alternatives there. Uh, you can find information about this in reproducibles.org. 
Okay, let's talk about Fedora now. Um, Fedora is interesting. Uh, you, you all know about this, so we'll go over it quickly. But like Fedora is built from centralized infrastructure that is managed by the CPE team within Red Hat. All of the package sources are stored in a single repository, well, in a single forge, I should say, in repositories within a single forge, which is this git, onsourcefedoraproject.org. All of the packages that become part of our release are built in the same gas credit. Definition does not include this, and uh, without the information about the build environment, you actually cannot reproduce the builds in Debian. It also, so they don't actually uh, satisfy their own definition. <laughs> uh, um, so the solution is that we just ignore some tags. And luckily for us, there are tools that do this already. Uh, the RPM diff tool that comes from the RPM lint project uh, already knows how to suppress differences that are not interesting. And then when there are differences that are interesting, we can use Diffoscope for doing in-depth comparison, because Diffoscope makes it very easy to see, oh, this file changed from this RPM to this other RPM, and that's what we care about, not that the signature is different. Um, so, um, when people start working on uh, making package builds reproducible, uh, this, this happened in Debian, in Debian it happened the same way in Fedora, uh, you soon realize that um, there is a whole class of problems that uh, could, in principle, be solved in the packages, uh, in the in individual packages or in individual tools, but it's very, very hard to do uh, because, for example, there's an issue that occurs in 10,000 packages. And it's much easier to add a um, post-build uh, cleanup step uh, that will fix uh, something that happens very often. And um, this tool in Debian is called Stripped on Determinism. It's written in Perl, and it's targeted at Debian-specific problems. So we ended up re-implementing it partially in a slightly different way, in a, in a, also in a different language, in Rust. Uh, and uh, it's called Add Determinism because it's better to name things in a positive way than in a negative way. Um, and... Uh, it was added, so uh, the, uh, the steps that are called uh, uh, after the build are called B BRP, build root policy scripts, because they're usually scripts. Uh, and um, the uh, RPM configuration has a set of macros that recursively define what gets pulled in, what, what are the steps that are done. And so, um, to m make add determinism uh, active in package builds, we, well, we, we had to patch, package it, make it available, and also modify the uh, RPM configuration to actually call it at the right moment. And this has happened for Fedora 41. Um, now let's talk about some interesting examples and scenarios uh, that we've encountered to help make builds reproducible in Fedora. Um, uh, you should do this one, actually, I think. <laughs> so, um, uh, the, the first step without which builds are completely irreproducible uh, is time. Uh, so, um, um, basically, uh, even if you take, um, I mean, even if you are very careful and preserve all timestamps, uh, the build, builds happen at uh, different uh, times and with different speed, which means that uh, even if we were to set the clock to a specific value to try to reproduce a build that happened at some point in time earlier, this wouldn't work because our machine is, has slightly different speed than the original machine. So as the build progresses and different things happen at different offsets in time, those offsets would be completely different. And um, timestamps uh, of v different things that happen during the build are very visible in the build output. So um, uh, the modification timestamps of files uh, are recorded and also uh, various tools record the time, for example, in, a, in a headers, in files, and so on and so on. And we need to, uh, well, fix this. And uh, the solution uh, also originates in the reproducible builds project. It's called source date epoch. Uh, it's the, basically the idea that you set a variable 
Uh, and everything that happens during the build, uh, we pretend that it happened exactly at the source date epoch time. So um, the, the timestamp of source date epoch divides the timeline time line into two parts. So everything that happened earlier, uh, so uh, upstream sources, source generation, and upstream tags, and so on. Uh, then we have the, uh, this, the, the time when the package build uh, officially happened. It is uh, exposed as the source data type of variable to the build process. Uh, and the build happens after that. And to make builds reproducible, we clamp the time to source date epoch. So everything that was, all the times that are after source date epoch get trunc uh, clamped, truncated to the source date epoch uh, timestamp. Mm, and uh, the specific implementation of this that is done in, for RPM uh, is that we take the uh, timestamp of the last change log entry. Uh, and uh, then, well, I mean, it all happens automatically. You write a change log entry, you put in the date, and this is the, the time when the build officially happens. And then when you, you do a rebuild later, it, this, I mean, it still works. Mm. And, uh, okay, so let's look at some specific examples. And, um, this particular example uh, is um, uh, from, from a um, Java package, and the solution uh, that, that is uh, implemented in the undetermism. So uh, I'll talk about the details of the problem later, but essentially Javadoc inserts the, uh, the time of the build into the output, and we need to uh, well, clamp it to source state epoch, and we don't do this during the uh, build itself, but in the cleanup step after. Uh, and then this can apply to all Java packages, which we have a couple of thousand of, so it's more efficient than trying to fix individual packages. And uh, the actual problem, well, I mean, it's kind of obvious. Javadoc was called at some specific time and inserts the exact timestamp. And so we just remove that. So the, here the, it's the diff between the uh, file that was produced by the build and the file that was cleaned up uh, after the build. And uh, so one, this, this like freeform timestamp is removed and this uh, other timestamp that has like a machine readable format is uh, clamped to the source date epoch. Uh, another example, uh, that also involves time is uh, static archives. So a static archive uh, is a, well, a, an archive, a tarball of object files. Uh, and it's a... Has a question. Yes, please. I hope we fixed this for you. So Nick Clifton added uh, source epoch time to bin utils and uh, static linkers to fix this specific issue because we, we definitely want to make it reproducible. Did it also fix the user IDs? That's not bin utils fault. <laughs> so so uh, <laughs> let, let me, uh, I, it's actually an excellent question. And I think that it's, so, uh, okay. Let, so what happens here? So the archive contains uh, object files and the object files are, um, uh, each object file has a modification timestamp uh, that we see here, and the owner, uh, so the directory not, doesn't have, I mean, it's owned by root, but the, this all file was owned by my user with the user ID 1000 and group ID 1000. And uh, when builds, uh, so, so th this number is not fixed, right? Because different systems will have uh, different uh, UIDs and GIDs. Uh, and we don't want that. Uh, so we removed, I mean, we, we said that everything is owned by root and uh, we actually zero out the timestamps. Uh, and this way the, the file has more zeros and it compresses nicer. Um, and Carlos said that uh, GCC was fixed to uh, do this, the same thing, yeah. binutils. 
but this is an example where, um, so it's very easy to create static archives. And you, some are created by calling GCC with the right options. Some are created by uh, calling, uh, I mean, so by some make file. And some are created by people running some script that does crazy stuff. And there's just so many different ways that um, R is called to create a static archive that it's very hard to ensure that all the different ways are covered and it's actually still necessary to have the, uh, the generic cleanup even if we end up improving some specific tools um, to not require that. Eventually, yes, but the thing is, uh, packages that were built before that change flew into Fedora are still, still might have this problem, so. Uh, but um, you, you would need um, to change R to not record user IDs. Uh, It, it doesn't go into such details, but R is a generic tool, right? And it, because, um, so okay, so I have to repeat the question. The question was um, if uh, R root at search date epoch, then we don't need to uh, do the cleanup here. R is a, um, okay, so search, the time stamp is one thing, but the user IDs are a different problem because um, even if search date epoch is set, how would R know in general that it's not supposed to record the ownership? It has an option to not, do, I mean, to, to, to use root, but then you have to find every place where R is called and make sure that this option would be set. And it's just, um, so the problem is that this, it's a very generic tool that is called in many, many different ways and it's hard to figure out all the right places. Uh, okay. Another example, and also another thing that is uh, fixed by ad determinism. Uh, it's kind of the same issue, jar files for Java um, bytecode. Um, the jar file has lots of very um, strange metadata, uh, like, I don't know. Uh, the uh, operating system of origin is questionable. <laughs> but it also has a timestamp uh, and we need to get rid of the timestamp and uh, because of technical reasons the way we do it is that we unpack the jar file and repack it with a different tool and it sets much less metadata and also gets rid of the timestamp. Mm. So okay so we, we had time, we had user IDs uh, and the general problem uh, is that all non-deterministic build steps must be removed. Um, so this is something that usually needs to be done in the individual tools that produce outputs. Uh, so I don't know, like uh, if you read files from the file system, they can be read in different orders depending on the file system. Uh, so this must be sorted. If you have a list that is generated by something uh, unpredictable, uh, you must sort the list. Uh, if you have multiple threads, you must take care to uh, merge the outputs in predictable order, and so on and so on. And uh, uh, the example, um, so one example is lists in, uh, in packages. So if you have, during the build steps of the package, I mean, not in the package itself, but if you are operations where you have, like, you're appending to a list or you're creating a list or a set, and this isn't ordered, you can end up with items in different order and that is a non-reproducible example. So this is an example from one package where um, you, this was a Python package and different builds results in different ordering uh, of this field and that, that's an issue. This was test model. Uh, the solution ends up being fairly simple. You just sort, sort the set. Um, but that's something that you have to fix package by package because it's gonna be specific to the different package and different packages will have different examples of this problem. And this is just one example of non-deterministic, uh, non-deterministic build steps that have to be fixed case by case. Now the good thing here is that this is something you can fix upstream and it's, it's actually a legitimate bug. So once it's fixed upstream, it's fixed in for every distribution, not just for Fedora. So uh, the, the bug is that um, 
if you run this build and you happen to have the same uh, include file in both places, at sometimes you would get the one and on sometimes you would get the other and it, this would be very, very confusing. It's a small bug, but yeah. a bug. I use a bug. There were hands, yes. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm just super interested in all of this because I'm a tool chain person, so it's super nerdy interest for me. Um, so Python says sorted is guaranteed to provide a stable sort. Do you yes. know what they're actually using for it? Is it just a CUTF8 sort or something? Or? So Python sets are sorted by the uh, hash of the object, so they're uh, not, uh, uh, I mean, like, not predictable in any visible way outside. Yeah. Was there another question? Yes. So the dictionaries are sorted by insertion order, and it's uh, not a problem, but sets are a different thing. So, <laughs> I'll speak quieter. So some of the issues that you're seeing here that are package specific that uh, can be fixed upstream, uh, uh, Debian's been at this for quite a few years now and presumably fixing these upstream, so why aren't they fixed upstream yet? <laughs> That is an excellent question. Um, I, I think the answer is that there is just a lot of software and software keeps changing and things, and like new bugs keep being introduced. So it's, it's just an, one of those never ending problems. Uh, I think we can uh, we'll become clearer at the end. I think, uh, uh, let's return to this question later. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, well, okay, so. Another thing that is, uh, we have a tool that produces code that is, uh, that varies, actually here it mostly varies between different architectures. So, uh, Python packages have, uh, well, .py files, and uh, in, during the build process we produce the bytecode uh, for them, so, so, so that when the package is used, Python doesn't have to read the, uh, the original code and uh, parse it. It uses, it just reads the uh, bytecode, which is faster. And um, the bytecode is written in a way where it's essentially a, a long uh, series of Python objects. And uh, the objects, when they're serialized, they have a, a flag that says this object may be uh, reused later. And then when, when in, later in the, in the file, when instead of writing the same object again, you, you give a reference by number to one of the objects that were flagged earlier. And it turns out that uh, sometimes uh, objects are flagged for being used later um, in an inconsistent way. So either they are not used at all or they're, or they're used at different number of times. Uh, and um, no, so they are not used at all. Sorry, and uh, this is because, like, depending on on how the objects are laid out in memory, this 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 flag thing is uh, not set. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not a bug; it's just not reproducible. And uh, we uh, clean this up again in add determinism in a a specific handler, and uh, we read the file, we check which references are unused, and zero the flag out. And um, this is actually an example of a thing that was, that affected maybe 8,000 packages in Fedora, so it was a very widespread thing. And one would ask, why hasn't Debian hit this? And the answer is that Debian does not uh, package PYC files. They produce them when the package is installed, so our uh, RPM method is more efficient because we only do it once during build, uh, but this issue just wasn't encountered in other distributions. Uh, another example is macro expansion. Um, we might have macros that expand to different results on different architectures, and that can lead to differences in the source RPM itself, not in the binary RPMs. Um, you had a hand. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I don't. I don't want to get ahead of you. But um, when when I start thinking about uh, reproducible builds, I naturally start thinking about portable builds, and I mean that in that 
you know, we've kind of, in a way, lost the ability to take like a rawhide source RPM and build it on, say, a previous version of RHEL. And I think that in Fedora, we have gotten to a point where we kind of abuse macros. Um, spec files have become a DSL that, you know, it's kind of as clear as a proc mail config file in a way. Uh, so when you're talking about reproducible builds, there's nothing that a source RPM provides you to guarantee that you're pulling in you know, the, the macro expansion definitions and any other tools that those macros then call. Um, so is, is, there, is that like a thing that you've run into with this or is that something that you're thinking about uh, that we can approach? I would love to see an ability for RPM build to generate a source RPM with a fully expanded spec file. I so mean, that would be we, heinous. We, we have that actually. So there is a tag in the in the source RPM with the fully expanded. Right, but also spec. generating um, uh, build requires for all the. Uh, yeah, we don't yeah, have that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we also, but that's part of what we were saying earlier that you do need the metadata. Right now, the, this only works if you have the metadata that comes from the build environment itself, and part of that is the set of macros I use to build yeah. the package, and it's just a condition of how this is made yeah. now. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have something else you want to add on this. Um, so, it's uh, we record this, the expanded build required set in Koji. Uh, we could put it in the source RPM, uh, well, not in the source RPM. We could put it somewhere. Um, uh, but it would be an extra thing to distribute. Uh, I don't, it's, it's, mm. it's necessary to produce stuff, but I mean, we have it in Koji. If we if we, if we insist, we can put it in. Can in we the get file, it but programmatically out of Koji? Uh, yes, yes, it's a okay. NPI call. Uh, you can also get it programmatically out of Koji if you turn on the RPM show RC f I'll plug into mock, which oh. dumps the entire thing. I've been trying to get that turned on in Koji for years. Oh, okay. I did not know this existed. I, I asked for this, and uh, people told me to use um, the Koji API to query stuff, but that's, I like this answer. So not to get into much of a rabbit hole here, but there's this, this gets into the full discussion about source RPMs in Koji because right now it's made on one random architecture and that's the source RPM that's used. So you can't programmatically get it. There's a ticket about this. It's a long discussion. I, I can point you guys to it. But there's a lot of aspects to that. Like it's very wasteful to build a source RPM on every architecture and then distribute all those source RPMs on every architecture. So. I don't know. It's a tough problem. It's, it's treated like no arch packages, I believe, now, where it's built on just one, right? Uh, right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, anyway, it, the particular issue we have with uh, h here that is that depending on the architecture, um, you get a slightly different set of uh, build requires. And if uh, something is pulled in via, via dependency, it can provide a macro definition. So in, in one build, this um, Perl wasn't installed and this, or Perl devil wasn't installed and this macro wasn't expanded. And then in the other build, it got expanded to, to nothing, to, to an empty string. Uh, and uh, for us, this is a problem because it, it was not yep. reproducible. Uh, and related to this, you can have, um, you can have arch dependent metadata where you can have, for example, requires or build requires that are gated by architecture, and then this will result in different different content in the package metadata. Um, there is a proposed solution here, which we could make these conditionals uh, with the, I don't know what this is called, the conditional syntax, I guess? Rich dependencies. Rich dependencies, excellent, thank you. And uh, and that would be encoded properly, and that's uh, there's a ticket about that, uh, so that's a potential solution here that would make this better, hopefully. Um, so. Uh, the nice thing about, I mean, like, if this was only about reproducibility, we probably wouldn't, um, wouldn't be enough of a motivation to do this. But people have this problem that they would like to run a repo query on packages, uh, on source packages, and get a, the real list of build requires. And the nice thing about this uh, um, build requires is that it's the same on all architectures, and you get an answer. 
that is well allows you to like I mean get the full build require set. And with this thing, you have to you would have to query build requires on for every architecture and then then do a summary, which is yep. kind of annoying. <laughs> It was a pain because when we implemented mass pre-builder for orchestrating mass rebuilds, this problem shows up right away. Yeah. Um, I'll talk about yeah. this one because it was fun. Uh, so um, the earlier stuff was like problems with with our tooling and with how do we build, and this was an actual problem in, in a package in a way. So. Um, I was doing diffs and uh, the, the, the FITIC package, some, some um, scientific software, had timestamp modifications on pretty much all files. And uh, this is strange because, uh, well, we, we, have, we have the whole thing with source date epoch and clamping and this shouldn't happen. As, and if we look at the, uh, the package itself, uh, there is a a uh, changelog entry that on Saturday, June 15th, uh, a build was made, right? And we look at the commit timestamp and it all agrees. Uh, and the problem is that this timestamp, Saturday, June 15th, is in um, time zone, uh, Europe, in the European time zone. So this is actually June 14th in UTC. This timestamp, there is no time zone. So, and no, no time. So, this is actually Saturday, June 15th, 00, zero UTC. So, uh, two hours um, uh, off. Wait. Uh, Further. Yeah, two hours yeah. later. And the manager, I, I talked with the manager, and uh, they, he said that he quite often does work around midnight and has, he has seen this issue quite a few times that RPM was telling him that the timestamps are wrong. Uh, and uh, so the build was done very soon after, I mean, within two hours. So the, uh, when the build was done in Koji, source date epoch was uh, mm, ahead. So the clamping didn't happen effectively. And then when I did the rebuild a month later, source date epoch was in the past now and the clamping happened, so the timestamp didn't match. And, uh, Actually, the, the nice solution to this problem is to use RPM autospec because RPM autospec doesn't, I mean, it gets the timestamp correct. Yes. Oh, yeah, this was another example where on SL Linux policy devel, uh, he was only building the documentation on some architectures that happened to have graph in the build road, on others it did not. And the solution is just always having graph in the build requires because clearly we need it to make the documentation. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a nice example that uh, because the, the spec file had a globe like for uh, this HTML slash star here and nobody noticed that you actually don't get the documentation most of the time. But. So there's another packaging time bug. When your package includes a symbolic link, the timestamp of that symbolic link on the file system is the time that you installed the RPM, <laughs> which makes reproducible installs impossible. I think that this is something that should be fixed in RPM itself. Yeah, this seems like an RPM, like an actual RPM bug more than. I, that, yeah, we, I, we can talk later. <laughs> no, no, this definitely, this definitely needs to be fixed because we want to have uh, reproducible image builds. Yeah, th this seems like a problem for images or containers or any of those things. Um, oh, you explain this one. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is probably the most complicated example that we, that we had. Um, so uh, the way it looked in the trial builds was that, uh, I mean, for example, it affected systemd, but actually many uh, or most builds with many executables. All executables were different in the rebuild. And it turns out that the difference was that the executable contains a, a hash of the debug info data to link to the right debug info data. And it was actually the debug info data that was different. And in the debug info packages, well, they, they, the, the files were different. Uh, 
And after some investigation, it turns out that it was only the GDB index sections that were uh, different. And the GDB index section um, is actually not created during the build itself. It's added in a um, post-processing build step. And this is another example where uh, of something that uh, well, it's specific to Fedora because other distributions don't do this. We insert the GDB index section to, to make uh, GDB work uh, faster. Uh, and so it just wasn't encountered earlier. And the, the problem was that uh, when, uh, so GDB was called to, to, to create this index and uh, the, the result was functionally identical, but this, it wasn't sorted the same on different builds depending on the number of workers that were uh, active. And I mean, this was, this was solved, uh, reported and solved, and, and it was, I mean, completely over the top of my head. I, I would have never been able to figure this out myself. Yes. Um, oh, we can also have problems with the tools that do the rebuilds, uh, where it turns out with Koji, Koji has the GNU maker to one, and that results in different values for the platform. And Koji answers Arch for no Arch builds, but when you do these builds in mock, you get different results sometimes. Yeah, I, I put this here with a question mark because uh, I have no idea how it ends up this way. Maybe somebody who knows how this works can explain why the platform setting in Koji builds is different than what you get in mock. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, we had another one. Uh, yeah, also I mentioned before the signature, but the signature is not the only RPM tag that isn't reproducible or isn't useful for reproducibility, um, for reproducibility in general. So if you look at things like build host, build time, build host and build time are the host the machine, the package was built, the time of the build. Op flags is the compiler flag, the expanded compiler flags that were used, and spec is the expanded render spec file. Now, we could strip these in- So this is the thing that David asked for. Yes. Uh, we could strip these in the in the build world, but they are useful in the build environment. But they are useful because if, if you're debugging, it is kind of useful to know, oh, this package was built on this machine. Maybe this machine was broken, or things like that. Um, so there's been there's been discussion on what to do about these. Uh, that was not me. <laughs> the, um, in the end, we think it's what we should do is just ignore them for comparison purposes when we check for reproducibility, but preserve them because they do provide useful information. Uh, but there are discussion in those RPM issues if you're interested. All right? Yes, so put in other words, uh, since we have to uh, ignore the signature and the uh, header immutable field in the RPM which duplicates the signature and some other things anyway, then we might as well just ignore a bunch of extra fields that yep. we know are not uh, reproducible. Okay, so that was a roundup of interesting test cases. Now let's look at where we are now and where things are going. Um, so right now we're doing distro-wide rebuilds in mock and comparing the results uh, that mock gets with the results in Koji and that tells us whether something is producible or not. This is done with tooling that we have wrote that is available on GitHub. Uh, it's being done on some AW, random AWS machine. Um, we are filing issues uh, for, if we find systemic issues that we know will affect multiple packages that need to be addressed as a whole, we are filing issues and tracking them, but a lot of these end up being like one of these one package is cursed in one particular package specific way and really needs to be addressed there. Uh, we also have documentation. Uh, we started writing up documentation for this to make it easier for people to understand what we're doing and ideally help. Uh, these numbers may or may not be accurate, uh, but they are close, uh, but we are not doing bad as you can see. Yeah, I think we, we so the numbers are not reliable because this sample is a limited set and uh, some packages are possibly counted more than once. So um, the Debian numbers are for the rebuild of the whole uh, distro and our numbers are for rebuild of some, some random subset of packages that were actually built within well, the last two weeks or something like that. Yeah, it's also worth noting when comparing between distributions because the set of packages in Fedora and the set of packages in Debian are like partially overlapping sets, but different, it, it's, it's kind of like, it's difficult to have an apples to apples comparison here. Um, but things are, things are getting there. Uh, next up, we have more issues to fix. Uh, there is a long list of issues to fix. 
Um, we would like to do another rebuild of all the packages and update these tests now that the mass rebuild has been done. Um, as we find new issues, we will probably end up adding new handlers to add determinism to address them. Um, right now, this is all done manually by Spishek. It'd be real nice to do this automatically so it doesn't require human involvement. Um, and ideally, when this is done automatically, we would like to have it integrated with the dashboards at reproducibleblitz.org so that you can get those nice graphs that show up going up into the right. Um, maybe we can show this, show the graphic if people haven't seen uh, that. Yes, if the browser works, we will see. I have no idea how that works. Um, yes. Yeah, so it'd be nice to have something like this. And this is, this is very nice because, well, I mean, you can see that over time as the number of packages grows, the, also the, the reproducibility, so the, the fraction of the green compared to the total also slowly grows. Let's uh, go, there. go back here. I don't know how to use the trackpad with my non-dominant hand. Uh, yes, and if you would like to try yourself, maybe you have a package, you want to check if it's reproducible, or you find you're in that list that we linked earlier and you would like to fix your package, uh, you can clone the tool, you can run it with an MVR, and it'll, it'll grab the Koji build, it will redo the build locally with mock, it'll compare them, and it will tell you if you're good or not good. And I think that's all we had. Yeah. Any questions? I think we have time. Yes. Um, when do we make a decision or when do we have a discussion about really making Fedora reproducible, like locking in all the good work that you've done? So, I mean, we had the same problem when we were bumping to C99 minimum language features that like took months in Fedora to get all the packages up to speed. But then to lock it in, we changed the Red Hat RPM config thing so that you know we don't regress on C99 as the minimum. So I see this work being incredibly valuable uh, for a number of different reasons, especially the reason that you can just do the build again on a different build server and check to see if your build servers have been compromised yep. or if there have been other security issues like secure supply chain questions. Um, so when do we lock it in or when do we have that conversation? I think we need automated rebuilds first. Uh, like I would like to get to the point where you get tickets filed in Mozilla, like uh, like you get like today you get FTBFSs or FTI ticket. I would like to get FT non-reproducible and that like something is wrong with your package and it's not reproducible anymore. And you need to fix it. Uh, to get there, I think we need to address more of these like wider class of problems um, that we have now, and and then we need to have automation so that this this process runs automatically. It doesn't require human involvement. We have a thing we can point packages at and all of that. And even earlier before that, I, we, I think we need to fix all the widespread issues. Yep. So for example, we, we, uh, I talked about one issue with PYC files, but there is another one when if you have a class that uses a set uh, to define the fields, this is for some reason not, repro and not reproducible in the serialization. And there is maybe a 800 packages that are affected by this, and I don't think it makes sense to file 800 bugs for this. I want to have it fixed in the tooling before doing that. And that's a good segue because I lost this slide, and uh, we do have links. Uh, so there's the issue tracker that I mentioned where we track things. We have the documentation and documentation site. Um, there's upstream discussions going on on this, and there is a matrix room, and if you're interested in this work, I would recommend joining the matrix room. Uh, if there are issues that you want to work on, uh, it's useful to bring it up there so that people don't do duplicate work. Um, if you want to help in any way with all of this, it, it's definitely, it would be valuable to have your input there. Mm, so the current status is that we have maybe a thousand uh, known issues, in, I mean, thousand known packages with problems, and uh, it's a mix, right? So, some issues are like, affect uh, hundreds of packages and need to be fixed at some in one place. And then there are some issues that are just like, package specific uh, things because the, like it's very common for packages to generate a header file or something like that in a irreproducible yep. way. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.